appreciate you coming out. I want to begin this, this evening by saying uh, thank you again for your wonderful hospitality this week. We appreciate the meals that have been provided. Appreciate the fellowship as well, and uh, certainly your faithfulness to the house of God and the things of God, and uh, appreciate your faithfulness here tonight on a Friday night. For I was saved, there were a lot of other things I did on a Friday night besides go to church. Amen? Didn't you do other things besides go to church on a Friday night before you were saved? Take your Bibles tonight and go to the book of Joshua 24. <laughs> Joshua 24. I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm glad the Lord saved me and delight, delightful to be here. Joshua 24. Once you find your place, if you're able to stand, stand with me. And I know that you have it. Joshua chapter 24. The heralding cry from Joshua here, Joshua 24, he addresses the people of Israel in verse number 14. And listen to what he says in Joshua 24, 14. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And then notice the challenge in verse 15, a scripture verse that oftentimes we'll see at the door of a home or sometimes in homes. It's, he says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. And whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Notice the people's response in verse 16. People answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Go to Judges chapter 2, just a couple chapters over. And notice it says in Judges chapter 2 and verse 6, When Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And notice in verse 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he, had did, for his, that he did for Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And verse 9 notes where they buried him. In verse 10, also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them. And notice the description of these people, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. A few nights ago we began a series of thoughts using three chairs to represent three generations. We talked about first-hand faith and then passing the torch of truth. Tonight I want to go ahead and close it out with thoughts about how to dwell in that first chair. What's required to have first-hand faith to be the Joshua generation? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the privilege to be in your house and with your people. And Lord, as we come before you, we pray your blessing upon your word. May your Holy Spirit do what I cannot do. And I pray, Father, tonight you would take your word and put it in the hearts of your people. Blessed as only you can, and I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. First-hand faith. When we begin a few nights ago, we begin first by representing those three generations with three chairs. And the first generation we saw was the Joshua generation. This was the godly generation. This was that cry of Joshua that says, don't know who you're going to serve, but like planting a flag, he said, for, as, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's not up for vote every week, what we're going to do. Uh, serving the Lord isn't something we do, it actually is something we are. It's just who we are. It's the default setting. We saw that godly generation, it was a committed generation. And we saw the focus of those in that chair was upward. 
Of everybody they, concerned, they were concerned about pleasing, it was God they were most concerned about pleasing. They cared what he thought. They cared what, what he wanted. And, and they lived for him more than anybody else. And thus their private life and their public life was the same. There was no difference. They were totally consistent. We said the spiritual temperature of those in this chair is hot. They're passionate about the Lord and they burn with a desire to serve Him. But then we saw a second generation come along and this was the elders that outlived Joshua. And we called this the God-limited chair. Theirs was not a life of commitment, it was compromise. It wasn't that they rejected the Lord, but they just didn't serve Him with all their heart. They had a spiritual temperature that was lukewarm. And unlike those in the first chair, they tried to serve two gods, not just one. And in so doing, they produced a third generation that out of that confusion, let me just say tonight, when you try to serve two masters, you're going to confuse everybody around you. They're really not going to figure out who the true God is. And they'll almost always take the easy way out which is down, not up. It was this generation that produced the third generation, that generation that knew not the Lord, the godless generation. Theirs was a life of conflict. They weren't for the Lord, they were against Him. They didn't serve the Lord, they served other gods. And they didn't fear the Lord. There was no sin sensitivity at all. I call it this, they lost their blush. They could, they could do whatever they wanted to do and it didn't bother them what God thought. Their focus was inward. Their God was self. As I look at America tonight, that's a pretty common God in our nation today, is the God of self. We try to create God in our image. Instead of figuring out who he is, we try to tell him who we want him to be. Yeah. And we base it all on the God of self. And so that first lesson, the question I had for you was, what chair are you in? Raise your hand if you know, after having heard that lesson, what chair you primarily sit in. Just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask. Did you figure it out? Did you figure out what chair you're in? Okay. Parents, did you figure out what chair your children are in? How many of you parents had pillow talk, talking about here's our kids and here's how they order their life and we, we talk about our children and, and we know what chairs they're in? And then children, you should know what chair your parent is in also, your parents. So the first lesson was identifying where we were. But then the second lesson was passing the torch of truth to that next generation. And we said there were three things that we had to do to get the torch of truth to the next generation so they would be first chair Christians, not second chair. And the three things, number one, were these. We had to teach our children God's Word. We had to teach them God's Word. And there's a lot of ways to do that, from the house of God to your home to just, just taking that time. But our children should know the Word of God because in doing that, they'll know who that God of the Word is. But then we said we had to teach them His ways. Do you remember the three ways how God operates? He deals in holiness, number one. He's a holy God. He delights in mercy. And the culmination of those two is this. He died for people. Amen. You see, those in the second chair, you know who their God ultimately becomes because He's more visible and tangible? The God of possessions, not people. They serve materialism. And their kids figure out very quickly that the invisible God isn't as important as the visible God. And people aren't as important as possessions. I want to remind you tonight, Jesus Christ left all the possessions to die for people. Yeah. It was all about people. For God so loved the world, and the world wasn't the materialistic world, it was the souls of men and women, boys and girls, and He left His kingdom to come down here into a cesspool of sin to redeem lost and fallen people. And mom and dad, you and I have to let our children know they're more important than things. Amen? 
They're more important than things. But then we said we have to teach them His wonders. Those were the stones of remembrance. What mean these stones? And every one of us as Christians should repeat the stories of what God did for us the day we were saved and what God did for us as we served Him. We ought to have stories to tell. We ought to tell our story. We ought to tell them their story. Here's what we think God can do for you. And here's what He has done. Tell them His story as well. Don't stop walking past the stones. Don't stop telling the stories. Amen? But tonight I want to consider, go to Romans chapter 12, the third and final thought. In Romans chapter 12, I want to consider the four essentials for first-hand faith. Notice in Romans chapter 12, as we begin this thought tonight very quickly, it's not a lengthy message, but notice in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, listen to this cry from the Word of God. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reason service. And notice verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. What that simply means is, is don't try to be like the world. Don't be pressed into their mold. Don't have their priorities. But instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, which means determine what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Tonight, how do we get to that first chair? If you're saved tonight, how do you abide there? Let me just back it up. If you're not saved tonight, you can never be in the first chair until you get saved. Right. You've never tasted and seen the Lord is good. And the first-hand faith is all about Him. And so tonight, if you are saved, how can you spend less time in that second chair, or maybe even drifting between second, third, and first? How can you and I uh, get settled in that first chair? What does it require? What does it take to become first chair Christians on a consistent basis? It's not what you think. I remember my daughter Robin called me a few years ago. Uh, maybe three years ago, and at that time she was probably about 18, maybe just coming to 19. She had moved up to Alaska with one of her girlfriends and was living uh, with that family, and she, uh, and then uh, through a series of events, she was on her own. She was literally on her own in Alaska, kind of stranded, and, and as we prayed about it and talked with her, we determined no, coming back to motorhome wouldn't be the answer, and so she uh, uh, began to uh, spend time with another church family family, but she tried to get employment while she was up there. And one day I got this call from her, and this is basically how the call went. She was in tears, she'd been crying, she was at the end of her rope, and she said, Dad, I don't know what to do. I said, what do you mean? She says, Dad, I'm trying to get a job, I'm applying everywhere I can, but Dad, I'm only 18, I have no experience, and nobody wants to hire me. Nobody wants to hire me, Dad, I don't know what to do. I just feel like giving up. I don't even want to put applications out. I'm so sick of being told no. 3,500 miles away, Dad was getting that call. I remember chewing on that for a bit, and I realized that I couldn't throw in with her assessment, because if I did, I would just leave her stranded in attitude. She was calling Dad for a solution. And I thought, well, what do you tell a kid? No experience, and the employers aren't hiring because of that. You know, they're looking for something on the resume. And I paused, and the Lord kind of gave me this thought. I said, now, wait a minute. I want you to just pause for a moment because I know who you are. But you need to stop, first of all, and determine what it is a boss is looking for. What do you mean, Dad? I says, you think a boss is looking for a skill, but he's not. He's looking for attitudes. She says, no. I said, Yes. I says, go ahead, Robin, right now, just pick a, pick a word out of the air to describe a good employee, a good worker. What would be one thing about that worker that would make them a good worker, a good employee? She said, well, they, they would be punctual. Oh, good. Is that a skill or an attitude? Well, well that's, that's an attitude, Dad. Right, punctuality is an attitude. It's not a skill. Everybody's alarm clock works. It's an attitude. Y'all with me? Young people, you noting? I'm, I'm going to give you some free stuff here. Bosses aren't looking for skills. They're looking for attitudes. They may not even know that's what they're looking for, but that's what they're looking for. I said, well, give me another one. She says, well, they're hardworking. 
Well, is that a skill or an attitude? Well, it's an attitude, Dad. I said, yeah. I said, give me another one. We're getting on a roll here now. Dad's kind of got daughter thinking, you know. She said, well, they're, they're honest. They don't steal. I said, well, is that a skill or is that an attitude? Well, that's an attitude, Dad. And as we begin to roll through it, she begin to figure out, wow, it really is an attitude. I said, now listen, sweetheart, whether a boss is thinking of it or not, they're really looking for somebody with attitudes that are right, not skills, because they can always train the person with the right attitude. But if all they have is skills with a bad attitude, they won't be a good worker. So what you need to do, the next time you put your resume together, you need to put a paragraph on the front. I can't tell you what to say. It's got to be your words, but it should be something like this. I may not have a lot of experience. I may not look like I have a lot of cr criteria, but I will outwork anybody you've got. You'll never regret hiring me. I'll be there on time. I'll be honest, hard working. I'll be the best employee you ever hired. Because you put that on the front. Amen. Then I hung the phone up and I prayed it would work because <laughs> it was like, oh. you know, that was bad, you know, putting on a big face, but it was like, oh. <laughs> 48 hours later, she called me. Dad! Dad! I said, what? She said, I just got out of the interview. It's a two-step process. An insurance company uh, went ahead and saw my application, and, and the manager called me in and had the first interview. And then following the interview, she said, I'm going to schedule a second interview. And what that means, Dad, is I've probably got the job. But Dad, before I left, she looked at me, and this manager said, let me ask you a question. Who wrote that paragraph to start your resume out? <laughs> She said, well, I did. That's why you got this interview. I just throw something out for free. You know what I noticed in the young generation? They think the boss is looking for skills. He's not looking for attitudes. I don't care what they're saying out there with all the colleges and universities. They're looking for attitudes. We've reached a day to day where the skill is trumping the attitude. And we have uncharactered people in high places. And you know what? Our God operates the same way, though. He's not looking for skills. He's not looking for abilities. He knows what you... He's looking for attitudes. He's looking for a change of attitude toward Him. He's not looking for your skills and abilities. He's looking for availability and attitudes and, and a heart that says, I want to serve the Lord. Look at our handout real quickly. I wrote two things down. First of all, concerning this transformation of our mind tonight, if you and I want to be in that first chair, I wrote this down. When our hearts change, our habits change. Amen? You all with me? You think of the day you got saved and your heart changed, your habits changed. And if your habits didn't change, like the old color to say, if you is what you was, then you ain't. That's right. Yeah. He changes hearts, that's your inner ticker, that's the rudder that guides you. And when he changes your heart, there's an exterior change in your habits. Amen. Number two, if a person believes differently, he'll behave differently. Amen? Amen? If a person believes differently, they behave differently. And so tonight, look at four things. What is it you and I have to believe about the Lord tonight? Honestly have to believe this with all of our heart to change our habits and be in that first chair. Number one, you have to change what you believe about the person of the Lord. Write that word in there. To be in that first chair tonight, you have to change what you believe about the person of the Lord. Go to Hebrews 11 with me. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. This is faith promise missions. The very first word of the conference is faith. And Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter in the word of God. Hebrews 11 says this in verse number 6. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. The him there is God. Notice it goes on to say this, For he that cometh to God must first of all believe that he is. There's your source of faith. It's the person of God. True faith rests in God. But notice it goes on to say this, Not only believe that he is, but that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
You know tonight why people hang out in the second chair? You want to know tonight why there's a whole pile of lost people in America in that third chair living sinful lives? I'll tell you why. Because they really do not believe that God and God's Son are worthy of their trust. They really don't believe He rewards those that seek Him. He rewarded the wise men when they settled the search and came from far distances to seek the Savior, Matthew chapter 2. And let me say this, if He says He'll reward, He'll reward. They somehow believe that, that God is flawed and untrustworthy. Those in the second and third chair, I've noticed this, they actually believe that there is someone or something better out there than the God of the Bible. Look at Hebrews 4. Look at this. Go back just a few chapters. When you look at the book of Hebrews, the theme of the book of Hebrews is one word, better. Better. It says he's better, and then and they give all kinds of things. He's better than the old covenant. He's better than the blood of bulls and goats. Yeah, you know, there's the, it's a comparison all the way in the book of Hebrews between Old and New Testament economies and sacrifices. And notice in Hebrews chapter 4, Jesus Christ is being brought forth in verse 14. And listen to what's said in Hebrews 4, 14. He says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, and he's identified as Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Beside these verses, I wrote these words, I have this great high priest, do you? Notice it says, we have a great high priest. Do you have him tonight? <laughs> Could you tell me when he became yours? Could you tell me about when he wasn't just a high priest, he became your high priest? He became the one that mediates now between you and a holy, holy, holy God. Well, if he is yours, notice in verse 15, he's, he's a God who can be touched. He's approachable. And because he's high and he's great and he's approachable, we ought to go to him. That's what he says. You ought to come to Him. I've found that when I sit in that second chair, I honestly think there's something better than Him. Y'all with me? I mean, you, you, you just go ahead and make the list. He's better than... You know what the drunk will tell you? My God of booze is better than Him. He believes that. The people that chase materials, they actually believe this life is better than the next life. See, they're flawed in their thinking. And the very first thing you and I have to change is, is what we believe about the person of our God. He rewards very well. He rewards those that diligently seek Him. And He'll be a debtor to no person. And yet we chase other gods. Let me say this, that don't reward as well as He does. Change what you believe about the person of the Lord, number one. Number two, second of all, you want to believe differently, to behave differently, you'll have to change what you believe about the power of the Lord. You'll have to change what you believe about the power of the Lord. What kind of power does our God have? Well, I made the list. He has the power to forgive sin. That's pretty powerful. Amen? Amen? I mean, you and I can wash clothes, but He can wash sin away. Amen. My wife did the laundry today. And, and uh, the laundromat at the RV park, which, by the way, thank you for those accommodations. That's always a blessing. We can wash some stains away, but there's one stain we have no power over. The stain of sin, but He has power over sin. The Son of Man has power to forgive sin, the Bible says. Amen. I wrote this down. He's got the power to heal. Luke 5, 17. And let me say tonight, I believe in faith healing. I do. I've seen people healed. i got no time for faith healers. <laughs> Benny the Hen and company, got no time for those guys. It's charlatans. They're quacks. 
And I'm not grieving the Holy Spirit by saying that. They fleece people in the name of their God. And my brother Ronnie was always so succinct when we talked about that. He says, you know, they don't even believe what they tell you. He said, they tell you to send them 20 and God will bless you with 100. If they really believed that, they'd ask. They'd send you the 20 so they could get the 100. Some of you are still thinking about that one. <laughs> Our Savior has power to raise the dead. Our Savior has power over hell. Amen. Our Savior has power over death. We have a powerful, powerful Savior. And you and I need to remember that He is able. He is very able. Uh, the, the Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able. He is able. He is able. Our God is very able. Amen. And why we go to that second chair is simply because we don't believe about the power of the Lord. We think he's sometime, somehow handicapped and, and he isn't powerful enough to take note of our situation and help us in our time of need. Thirdly, Change what you believe about the pur purpose of the Lord. Go to Genesis 3. This is probably the most important one. But this is where we oftentimes, why we oftentimes don't stay in that first chair. Notice with me in Genesis chapter 3. Doubting the motivation of your God when He tells you to do something and in, in turn you disobey him is probably one of the most powerful influences in turning down the first chair. Notice in Genesis chapter 3. Look what's said in verse number 1. Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And notice the response in verse 2. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not touch it, neither shall you eat, and you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the woman and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now pause for just a moment. Satan says, No, that's not true. That's not true. But notice what he then says. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What was Satan doing? You know what Satan was doing? God is trying to keep something good from you. He went ahead and dealt with Eve on the motivation of God. He says, oh, no, 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 maybe, maybe God said that, but here's why. Because he's not for you, he's against you. He's keeping something good from you. I was up in Washington, D.C. I heard old Kenny Baldwin preach this text. You know what his title was? You've been played. He said, Eve got played. She got played. The devil played her. Made her believe something about God wasn't true. I mean a bunch of people that got played by the devil. Drunks get played by the devil. Amen? Let me say this. Carnal Christians, we get played by the devil. He convinces us that, 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 that you know, God's holding something good from us. And that if we just, you know, you, you don't want to follow him with all your heart because it's not going to help you. It's going to hurt you. There's something else out there better. You and I have to recognize what is God's greatest motivation. John 3.16, you finish it for me. For God so loved the world. What's God's motivation? It's love. You say, well, I, I, I don't feel like he loves me. What, have you stared at a bloody Calvary? Can you see what he did 2,000 years ago for you? He took his only son and had him butchered for you. I mean, there's no greater demonstration of love. Why would you require something even greater to prove who this God is and why he does things? To do so is to diminish the best he gave. To do so is to tell him there's something more important. There's a better way you could tell me you love me, Lord. Boy, isn't that what's going on today? 
I don't feel like the Lord loves me. That people say, I just don't feel like it. Why not? Well, because I prayed for the new Cadillac and I didn't get it. Boy, turn your eyes on upon Jesus. Amen? You go look at Calvary. It just reeks of the love of God. It just reeks of His motivation toward you and toward me. And, and, and literally, it's the greatest proof of His love. And, and we look right past that. It requires something else. You say, but I'm going through a tough time. Spurgeon said it so well. He says that God is too good to be unkind. And He's too wise to be mistaken. Amen. So when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Amen. Change what you believe about the person of the Lord. Change what you believe about the power of the Lord. Change what you believe about the purpose of the Lord and why he does what he does. But then finally, change what you believe about the provision of the Lord. Look what the psalmist said. And I want to close with this. Psalm 34. Look what he said. In Psalm 34. Beginning in verse number 1, the psalmist said this. He said it. He sang it. In verse number 1 of Psalm 34, he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord, and He heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto Him, and were lightened, and they were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him, and delivereth them. And notice how he pauses and ends this. He says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, watch this. Blessed are all they that put their trust, their faith, their hope in Him. When we truly believe that He is better, that He is able, that He's trustworthy and operates out of love, not hate, and He's a perfect God, He makes no mistakes. That i found when I focus on Him like that and see Him for who He really is, what I believe changes how I behave. And I rest in Him, and I serve Him, and I promote His kingdom, not mine. And I give to Him, and I live for Him. And the focus of my faith is Him, and I rest in that first chair. It's all a matter of focus. And I hope tonight your faith focuses on this God who's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And that you see Him for who He is, His person, His power, His purpose, and His provision. And that you're abiding in that first chair. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this thought. Use it in our lives, and though brief, I pray that You would challenge our hearts, Lord, to believe differently about You. I pray for that one tonight that doubts your motivation why you tell them to do what you want done. I pray they would look beyond even the command to your integrity. You're a God who changes not, you lie not. Your motivations are pure, your purpose is high, not low. Lord, I pray that we not doubt your heart toward us. Father, for each of us that are redeemed, help us to remember that in Christ we're the apple of your eye. We hold a unique position with you because of your Son. And then, Father, for that one that may not even be saved tonight, they, they just live a life for self. Lord, I pray they turn their eyes upon Jesus Christ. May they recognize you so love them that you gave them your only begotten Son that if they believe in Him completely, they'd not perish but have everlasting life. Move the lost to salvation. And Lord, each of us that are saved, change what we believe about you. Help us to see you for who you really, really are. 
And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Heads about, eyes are closed. Just give you an opportunity to respond tonight. Remind you tonight, the Lord's not looking for skills. He's looking for attitudes. He's looking for a change of belief in who He is. And maybe in the words of Kenny, don't get played. Don't think there's a better God out there than the Lord and His Son. See, everybody's thinking, Brother Dave's going to tell me I need to read my Bible, I need to do this, do that. Do... No. Change what you believe about Him. And your actions will definitely follow. See, because really, faith without an act is not a fact. True faith acts. So tonight, where are you? First chair, check, second chair, third. Brother, go ahead and sing. And you do what God tells you to do. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow. say you might like to come to the altar and pray about your faith promise. Pray about your stewardship. Maybe not only of the pocketbook but of your time, of your energies, of your talents. May God help us to see that what we have is all of Him. I can't help but be reminded of no good thing will He withhold from us. Psalm 84 says... Our God is a sun and a shield. What are we for Him? Might be something good to ask ourselves sometimes. Might be good to go to the altar sometimes and say, Lord, I'm not much for You, but I'd like to be more. But I need Your help. I think a lot of times the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. God help us. If you need to come on this verse, I invite you to come. The words to this song are so easy, you don't even need the hymn number. Would you sing on verse number three? I'll go with him through the judgment. I'll go with It's easy to say, hard to do, but sing it anyway. Where he leads me, I will follow. Do we need?
sing verse number four which I would like for us to sing I'd like to say that this song has always been kind of a puzzle to me in a way uh, that business about I'll go with him through the garden I've thought to myself nobody could go with him through the garden that business I'll go with him through the judgment I think we know what we mean by that but he bore our sins himself and he had to do it. We only do it kind of so to speak, I mean no disrespect, but sort of by proxy by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But there's one thing for sure. He will give me grace and glory. He'll give us grace for this time now. And I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy of the glory that shall be revealed in Him. Romans 8, 18. Would you sing together on verse number 4? I'll give me grace and glory. He will give me grace and glory. see the good crowd out tonight and I trust you'll have a good night's rest. Remember 10 o'clock in the morning is the visitation here at the church and Brother David is probably going to be over there at the Walmart place in the vicinity of like nine-ish I imagine to try to get set up and ready to go and that time zone is stated to be from 10 to 2 but probably he'll wind up being from 8.30 to about 3.30 or something like that, I imagine. If you can go by, I invite you to do so, but don't register. we got to get that one down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got it done. Anyway, if you can, go by and, um, hey, look around, see what's going on. You might want to try to pass out a few tracks and help out a little bit. See Brother David if you want to to make sure that it's done according to what he's got going. And uh, I trust that all of you will be praying for that endeavor tomorrow. We have a visitation program here at the church too at 10 in the morning. And I see a lot of our own people are signed up uh, in the afternoon shift over there. Uh, who knows, we may try to send some out your way ahead of schedule if they'd care to, brother. Won't you pray with me for that endeavor tomorrow? Amen. Brother David has already said something between 50 and 100 names he's hoping for that we can pass out. And please, people, keep in mind the real goal of this thing is to try to reach people for Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're not trying to hoodwink. We're not trying to bait. This is just a simple thing where we're trying to get people to understand that all those names on that car are folks who've died. It's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. May God bless you as you make your way home tonight to pray for that endeavor tomorrow. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for thy love and goodness. I thank you for the message. I thank you for these people. I pray thee to take them safely to their homes. Watch over them. Guard them. 
I pray Thee to speak to their hearts in the quietness of the midnight hours. And I pray, Lord, that in speaking to us, You might draw us mightily and powerfully unto Thee. And Lord, I do pray for Thy blessing upon tomorrow's endeavor, the 10 o'clock appointment here at the church for visitation and likewise out yonder at the Walmart and for the supper and the service tomorrow night. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good night. May God bless you. Have a good evening. I trust to see